Uh, Adam Smith is very rarely read. He's worshipped, but not read. And so, for example, everyone's heard of the phrase invisible hand, but almost no one knows how he used it. Uh, and the term invisible hand actually does appear in his classic Wealth of Nations once. It appears in an argument against what's now called neoliberalism. Uh, classical, what's now called neoclassical economics that we're supposed to worship. So we're supposed to worship Adam Smith and neoclassical economics, and they radically differ on the notion of invisible hand. Uh, Adam Smith was concerned, as David Ricardo later was, uh, that if there was free movement of capital and free import of goods, uh, he was concerned about England. He said England will suffer uh, because uh, British capitalists will invest abroad uh, and they'll import from abroad and that'll harm the English economy. Ricardo had similar concerns. Uh, and Adam Smith then gave an argument. It was not a very good argument, but his argument was that uh, English investors will prefer to invest in England because of what some call the home bias. They'll have a preference for investing close by. And therefore, as if by an invisible hand, uh, England will be saved from the menace of free capital movement and uh, of free imports. That's invisible hand. Uh, what, what's that got to do with... Uh, uh, the Cato Institute or the, or the modern uh, enthusiasm about uh, free capital flow and uh, um, that, you know, having uh, U.S. corporations uh, invest in China so they can send stuff back here to sell cheap, uh, exploiting Chinese workers. That's not Adam Smith. Uh, and it goes right across the board. I mean, e everyone who went to college uh, learned the first paragraph of Wealth of Nations in which he talks about how wonderful division of labor is, you know, allows for all kind of efficiency and productivity and so on. Uh, not very many people got to page, you know, whatever it is, page 400, uh, in which he points out that division of labor is monstrous uh, because it turns people into creatures as stupid and ignorant as a person can possibly be. Uh, as a person who just becomes a machine and that's a, a, a tr terrible attack on fundamental human rights. And therefore, he says, in any civilized society, uh, the government is going to have to intervene to prevent division of labor. Uh, how many people get that far? You know? In fact, uh, Smith does give arguments for markets, rather nuanced arguments. I mean, I just take what they call trade. You know, the so-called conservatives are very excited that trade is increasing. So, for example, NAFTA is supposed to be a great triumph of conservatism. It, uh, uh, it increased trade between Mexico and the United States. Well, it, it, it's true that cross-border interactions between Mexico and the United States increased. But would Adam Smith or any classical liberal or traditional conservative have called that trade? I mean, suppose General Motors assembles parts in Indiana and sends them to Illinois for uh, as, uh, assembly uh, and then to New York to sell. Is that trade? Well, well, suppose it happens to cross the Mexican border, but it's still internal to a huge command economy. Is that trade? Well, it turns out that if you look at the rough figures, which are all that we have, uh, before and after, uh, the part of cross-border interactions between uh, Mexico and the U.S. that was internal to a corporation was about 50 percent, and now it's about two-thirds. Uh, that's no more trade than if the Kremlin uh, uh, produced things in Leningrad and sent them to Ukraine for assembly and to Poland to sell. That's just operations internal to command economies. Uh, they, we have just simply, you know, they just to, even to talk about trade or free trade or uh, entrepreneurial values or consumer choice or democratic functioning and so on is putting us in a world of illusion and fantasy. That's why these terms are all demeaned, not just conservative.